Hello my friends and welcome, let's go for the front lines update at first and we have awesome news. Ukraine again crossed the Dnieper river to the enemy side. I'm not speaking about the Antonovsky bridge over here where Ukraine did it before, now we have the new direction, it's called Kazachi Lahari in this area. Yes, we don't have the military map update for that situation, however I know also from the Russian resources that they had to retreat from this area and partially surrender this territory. Well, not all of the village of Kazachi Lahiri is under control by Ukrainian forces, but Ukrainian warriors were able to land over there, creating the first point of logistics. I would say that it's the most important news for the last few weeks. If you subscribe for my Telegram channel, you already know some information about the case. Even the video was presented how our soldiers went across the Dnieper river and landed on the enemy side. This is not a fake, those are the real images of our warriors. So if you want to see all of that, I highly recommend you to subscribe for my Telegram channel, you may find the link in the video description just below. We are still in lack of the information of how much territory Ukraine was able to get. The Russian side says that one third of Kazachi Lahari is under control by Ukrainian forces and their forces had to retreat because mostly there were mobilized Russian men controlling this area. A couple of weeks ago there were elite forces from the Russian paratroop divisions, but they were sent to Zaporizhia direction. And mobilized soldiers are not so motivated to fight against the Ukrainian army. So what they did, they retreat from this area and Ukraine took as much territory as they could with the forces available. I'm sure that there will be some backup for Ukrainian forces and this bridge hold will be increased up to the point where we may reach this road. It is actually the biggest supply road on the southern part of Ukraine. Apparently Kazach Lahiri is located around two and a half kilometers away from this very important road. I think that potentially Ukraine has resources to move towards this road and cut supplies for Russia, especially after the recent attacks on the Crimean bridges in Hinichinsk and Chongar disabling the Russian logistics across the Siv Lake. To understand everything we need to see the bigger picture, the railroad bridge was cut, it was damaged and no longer in use by the Russian Federation. The Chang'er bridge, as I say to you, plus Hinichings were kaput, so all of this area is without supplies. So what they need to use is this road across Armansk that goes very close to Oleshki and then goes over here. After it, it leads to Melitopol city. But here is the deal. Ukraine, as I said to you today, landed on the enemy shore in Kazachi Lahari, very close to that road. 2.5 kilometers is really not a big distance. In that case, we may cut this road. So this part is cut already and this one will be cut hopefully. Based on that, Russia may lose the supplies for all of this region, where Ukraine is performing the counteroffensive operation. We know that Russia has huge problems with logistics, it is the weakest spot of their army, it always was. And based on the situation they are currently facing, I don't see any sort of the solutions for them. Well, you may say that they may still use the Berdansk Poor, but they lost many of the landing ships. Yes, they still have a couple of those landing ships in the Black Sea and they may potentially use them to deliver their army. But the Berdansk port is under constant fire control by Ukrainian army. Ukraine continued to use the long-range cruise missiles to target this point. So if Russia wants to get rid of one more big landing ship and everything that is inside, please welcome to Berdansk. And here it's the only useful port for landing the Russian army or to send some of the supplies. All right, and now let's speak about the possible advancement of Ukrainian army from the Kherson direction. You already know about the numerous landing operation attempts of Ukrainian army. One was successful near to Antonovsky bridge, but our guys are under constant fire by the Russian aviation mostly. So we have the bridgehead in this area and the second one already over here. I would say that we still may put this landing operation under the question because we are out of clue for how long our guys may hold over there. For sure Russia will send more reinforcements to that area. To counteract to that we need to work with our artillery demolishing the Russian forces on their way to attack our guys. Well, speaking in general, is the assault operation of Ukrainian army in this area is possible? 
I think so, but it is very hard to achieve this goal, basically because of the Dnieper River. So what steps require from Ukraine to achieve this goal of the counterattack operation in this area? First of all, we need to create lots of the bridgeheads on the other shore. Second, we need to build at least one or it's better two of the pontoon bridges across the Dnieper River. Without those bridges, the assault operation is simply not possible. The problem here is that Russia may use their aviation to target those bridges and also artillery systems. So how Ukraine may counteract that by putting some sort of the air defense system, very capable one like Patriot, in this area. Yes, it could be dangerous for the system, but in that case it may cover quite a lot of the distance and partially even Crimea. Russia may try to use their usual tactics with K-52 attack helicopters. They may target the air defense system flying at the low altitude. That is why Ukraine should deploy soldiers with man pads on the other shore together with some sort of the short range air defense systems. Those are very portable and we have them in Ukrainian army. In that case, Ukraine Ukraine may secure the pattern bridges and start a massive attack from this place. This is a very profitable direction, actually. Actually, around one month ago, I said that this operation is basically not possible because of the Dnieper River and the Russian aviation, but now I see that compared to Zaporizhia direction, this could be the way out for Ukraine to get into Crimea. And the biggest factor for Ukraine are the Russian defense lines. You see, there are not so many in this region compared to Zaporizhia direction, where there are a lot of the defense lines. Nevertheless, Ukraine army continue to propel forward and we're gonna speak about the situation in Arihiv direction today but let's first continue with this case this area is mostly a flat ground with no big trees and just few rivers here is the biggest desert actually in Ukraine on the north here we have Kazachi Lahiri where Ukraine just landed. Because of this very flat ground with just few of the natural obstacles, Russia is unable to build their defense lines as they did in Zaporizhia direction. The defense in such terrain require high maneuverability of the defending side, so Russians are unable just to stay in their trenches and wait for Ukrainian army. They have to move, they have to think, because they will be under the constant artillery fire by Ukrainian side. But those maneuvers require lots of the supplies, so let logistics. I would say that in case of the successful landing of Ukrainian army on the other shore across the Dnieper River, they need around 5 days to reach Crimea in that case. Yes, the landing operation itself is very difficult and Ukraine may have losses. But we should also count the losses, potential losses, in the Parisia direction. And compare the resources required for the front lines penetration over here or to build the pattern bridges and try to land on the enemy shore with massive forces in this area. But as I said to you before, cutting this road and cutting all of that may also influence the situation in Zaporizhia front lines. Without the proper logistics of our enemy, it could be easier for Ukraine to penetrate the defense lines over here. Why else do I think that the attack operation from Kherson is profitable for Ukraine? The main target for Ukraine is to reach the Crimean Peninsula. We need to eliminate the Russian military bases and the Russian Black Sea Marine Fleet. Crimea itself is not that defended compared to the front lines. Yes, Russia built the defense lines at the border of Crimea, but they are lighter compared to the ones in Zaporizhia. So first of all, it's the shortest direction to Crimea. Second, we don't really need the Mariupol port right now for Ukrainian economy because it was totally demolished. But we need to take control over this part of the Black Sea because it's our grain deal and also metal distribution to the third countries. With the Black Sea Marine Fleet presented in Crimea, it is not possible to achieve. The third thing, as I say to you many times, that geographically it's easier to cut out the Crimea from the Russian supplies. And the reason number four is the importance of Crimea for the Russian Federation. Liberating the peninsula may sound like somewhere near to the end of the war. But again, it's just the forecast and the good scenario for Ukraine. The reality nowadays, as you can see, it's very hard. Our guys continue to fight for every village, for every meter or foot of the land. And now let's zoom into the Zaporizhia direction where we have some updates of what is happening 
near to Robotina. Let's go to the timeline. It was yesterday and it is today. Some changes in this territory. The main vector of Ukrainian assault goes just between Robotina and Nova Prokopivka. Speaking about this area of the Russian defense, Ukraine wasn't able really to penetrate it. There was the main attempt. Our guys went ahead but were forced to retreat. Anyways, there is some movement and I'm sure Robotina will be liberated soon and I would say it's the first defense line of the Russian Federation. Then it goes intermediate defense line and the third one, then the defense line near to Tokmak. From our Rehiv positions, let's go to this area where Ukraine actually got some certain success near to Urozhaina. This is the Urozhaina village that is still under control by the Russian forces. They were able to build some certain defense over over here. So today with the force attempt of breaking this defense line of the Russian Federation, finally Ukraine went to the place. And our forces took the part of Urajina. Let's go to the timeline to see the changes over there. So it was yesterday and it is today. Clearly there is the assault vector of the Ukrainian army. What makes this area kind of difficult for assault because there is the natural obstacle, this very interesting river that goes all around the place. Plus the elevation ratio helps Russians to defend. Nevertheless our guys move forward and the main target in this area is to liberate Stara Malinivka. And by doing so we may go to the Russian defense lines. There is only one in this place. That is why I think Ukrainian command choose this direction for penetration. From what we see on the south there are two main vectors. One is over here near to Velika Novosilka and the other one in Orihiv direction. So number one, number two, two directions of Ukrainian assaults. Ukraine moved also in other places but from what I see the main ground was gained in just two of the areas. Let's go to Luhansk Oblast. After Russia lost the ground near to Nova Yehorivka, they tried to assault near to Novoselivska, actually taking this small village under their control. But this direction could be very dangerous for Ukraine because the main defense line goes all across those villages. Russia went towards them and was forced to retreat, but here are no any villages, just a single one. But I am sure that our defenders will not let Russia towards this water reservoir. The Deep State Map Resource publishes the information about the Ukrainian attack on Urajina. Yes, we have the losses over there, but mainly Ukrainian army went into the north part of the village. As I say to you, it is the fourth attempt of Ukrainian army to get Urajina under control. Probably on this image you may see that Russia created lots of the trench lines on the northern part of the village. Let me show you. It's over here, it's over here, it's here and here and also over here. And some of the trenches you may see on the drone image. The good thing now is that Ukraine start to receive more of the artillery shells. That helps a lot. Now we almost equal with the Russian artillery at some of the points. Again we have some interesting videos about what is happening on the front lines actually from the drone cameras. For example this is the Russian artillery Gyatsint S. So what happened to it you may see on this screenshot. Again, for more detailed information, I highly recommend you to join my Telegram channel. This day, 15 years ago, Russia invaded other country, Georgia. Russia actually occupied the vast part of Georgia. We're speaking about what they call South Ossetia and Abkhazia. If you look at the country shape, I think they occupied around 30% of the country, at least. The Russian army was bombing some of the facilities even in the capital city of Georgia, Tbilisi. The war lasted just for 5 days and Georgia had to give up their territory. And now they have mostly pro-Russian government. But Georgian people do support Ukraine and we have many volunteers and mercenaries who fight from Georgia in Ukraine. This is inside the Russian Trophate T-72B3 tank. As you can see, they have the menu, it's the modernized version, so it's quite interactive, I would say, but the hardware is same. As for the Ukrainian FPV drones, somehow our guys mastered the range of the radio signal and now capable to launch them for 15 kilometers. It is close to 10 miles. That is why you see more and more FPV interesting videos. Finally, White House signed the training bill for our pilots. 
they will be trained on F-16s in Europe mostly, but also, I think, in the United States of America. The Rain Metal Weaponry Production Concern bought 50 of the Leopard 1 tanks to Ukraine. They purchased those tanks from the single owner in Belgium, who somehow got 100 of the Leopard 1 tanks in his private ownership probably for the self-defense. Alright, the great move from the United Kingdom. New sanctions, but those sanctions are very special. They applied not just on the Russian military companies, but on the companies of the third countries. There was a problem, as I remember, with Kyrgyzstan, so Kyrgyzstan might have ordered a special load with, for example, chips or any kind of the military equipment, so the container to Kyrgyzstan went through the Russian territory, and then it reached its destination, it was empty, because there were some of the agreements between Russia and Kyrgyzstan, but now you cannot send the military equipment or sensitive equipment like chips through the Russian territory. Not just UK applies those sanctions, it will be applied by other countries too. Poland sends 1,000 more soldiers to protect its border with Belarus. Now 2,000 soldiers were already deployed, plus 1,000, so totally 3. Lithuania also reinforces its border, so probably they know something. According to the Moscow Times, Russia already took around 40% of the armored vehicles and tanks from the biggest storage, the military storage, in Bur it is called Vagzhanova military storage and it is the biggest one not just in Russia but it was the biggest one in USSR. So nearly half of the vehicles were taken, we know it from the satellite images. But those vehicles are very outdated plus the storage wasn't done properly. So I'm sure that the capability of the new units is much less compared to what Russia may produce. But anyways, it's weaponry, it may shoot, it may run and everything is important on the war field. My friends, and now please press the like to this video and also if you want to support my job, you might find some of the links in the video description just below. Special thanks for my Patreon supporters and the sponsors of my channel. I wish you all a peaceful sky wherever you are and have a great time.